First thing we need to look at as Paul is what made him so significant? What made him the goat, the greatest of all times? First of all, he had a radical conversion. If, in fact, if you're reading your chronological Bibles, today we hit Acts chapter eight and nine. Chapter nine really chronicles the conversion experience of Paul, who was formerly known as Saul. A couple weeks ago, we hit Stephen, the stoning of Stephen, and as Stephen was stoned, it said all the men who were trying to get a better range of motion on their throwing motion, they took off their coats and they laid him at this man named Saul's feet. Saul was a man who persecuted Christians. He approved the killing of Christians. He tried to gather all the believers up and put them in prison. And in in Acts chapter nine, we see this. This says, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters uh, from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, that's what they called Christians before they called them Christians, followers of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He wanted to imprison them. As he journeyed along near Damascus, and he suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Okay, two words of encouragement right there. When you experience persecution, in fact, Saul was throwing Christians in jail. Saul was approving of the stoning and murdering of other Christians. Saul's specific goal in life was to make it difficult for followers of the way, the Christ followers, to live their life of faith. And when Jesus approaches him on the road to Damascus, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting those Christians? Why are you persecuting the church? He doesn't say that. Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Saul says, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus, the one whom you are persecuting. So just Christians, as we face persecution in our lives, know that as people are casting stones, maybe not physical stones, but maybe verbal stones, maybe attacking you, maybe they're so courageous they're attacking you on Facebook, because that's how all the cowards do it, right? When they're casting those stones and hurling those insults and persecuting you because of your faith and your faithfulness, in reality, they're persecuting Jesus and Jesus will stand for you, and Jesus will support you, and Jesus will give you the courage to face the day. Paul says, Saul says, what do you want me to do? And he says, I want you to go to this man, and he's gonna explain to you, and I want you to get baptized. And for three days, Paul couldn't see. They had to, they had to guide him around. And I, I want everyone here to understand that the reason that, that Paul was the greatest wasn't because he had a radical conversion. Your conversion experience may be a beautiful story of the fact that you were six years old in a vacation Bible school and you prayed to accept Jesus Christ and ever since then, you've been walking with the Lord. That's the greatest testimony of all. His radical conversion gives us two points of really application. First of all, you are not too far removed from the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. I don't care what your past is. I don't care what you did this morning. You may say, Stephen, you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've seen. You don't know what I've done. I can promise you, you you probably haven't been killing Christians. You probably haven't been finding people who are following Jesus Christ and throwing them into prison for no reason. Paul's sole purpose in life was to really beat down the Christ followers. And God used him. God's grace, God's love, God's forgiveness reached out and touched him and brought him into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how far you are from Christ. You're never past the reach of God's grace. Second point of interest is you may be a Christ follower. You may be working alongside of. You may have a neighbor. You may have a friend. You think, man, God, there's just no way. Try God on that one. Test him. Pray for that person, love that person, invite them to church, show them what scripture says about living a life, not perfectly, but perfectly forgiven and striving for perfection of trying to be righteous for God's sake in his glory. Try God on that one. I promise you, nobody around Saul said, you know what what Saul needs? Saul needs Jesus. 
No, they just said, let's get away from him because he's gonna kill us. In fact, once he was converted, God kept trying to send people his way to disciple him and they were scared to death of him. He's gonna kill us, he's gonna throw us in prison. And God had to speak to a couple men specifically and say, no, you take a chance on Saul because he's gonna become Paul and become the most influential Christian of all times. The radical conversion should really kind of in us drive us just to find the furthest person from Christ, to find that person that's living such a pagan life, going so far against God and saying, God, that man, that woman is not past, not beyond the reach of your grace and your love and your forgiveness. It needs for us to take off the blinders of our little church Christian kind of circles, our holy huddles, and say, who can I love? Who can I share with? Who can I invite? Who can I sit down and present the gospel to? Because no one, no one is beyond the grace and the touch and the forgiveness of Christ, our Savior. Paul's radical conversion. Second thing that he had, really, it, it, it was an amazing thing because when you read Paul, and you're gonna be reading him if you're in the chronological Bible for the next several weeks, you're gonna see Paul's life. He had an incredible perspective. He had an eternal perspective. His perspective was Christ first. In fact, he said to live as Christ and to die as gain. His motto in life is if I'm gonna live, I'm gonna live for Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And if I die, who cares? It means I get to go to heaven and be with Christ forever. That was his eternal perspective. But there's three things that I really wanna look at. First of all is life's accomplishments. Because as I look around this room, there are some very accomplished people in this room. There are some people who have gotten degrees I can't, even, I can't even pronounce. People who have accomplished some great things in family, in life, in recreation. There are some people who have, who have finished great tasks. But this was Paul's approach. This was his perspective on his accomplishments in Philippians Chapter three, verse 10, I mean, verse four, it says this, though I might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I have more so. I'm more so. So what he says, if anyone thinks that they're accomplished, if anyone wants to look at, list their resume and their list of of, uh, accomplishments, I'm gonna beat you. And he lists just briefly. He says, Basically, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. He says, my pedigree, my stock, my accomplishments, no one can compare. I was circumcised on the eighth day just to perfection. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. That was a big deal. I was the Hebrew of Hebrews. I was part of the Pharisees. I was persecuting the church. No one was climbing up the ladder of religiosity as fast as I was. I was doing it all. And he says, but let me show you my perspective. Let me explain to you what that means in my pursuit of Christ-likeness. He goes on to say, but what things were gained to me These I counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. He says my degrees, my accomplishments, all of the promotions that I got, everything that people think about my past and to see how I moved up that religious ladder and all of the things I did, when you compare those to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, I consider them rubbish. Love that word, that's why I like that word, rubbish. Say rubbish this morning. That's what you've done, that's your past, that's your history, it's trash, it's garbage. It's nothing compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus. And when we get proud and puffed up and say, look at what I've done, look at what I've accomplished, Paul's perspective would say, no, that's rubbish. What are you doing for God in his glory and his kingdom today? 
Don't look at your past. Don't, don't get so frustrated or don't get so proud of what you've accomplished in the past that you miss the opportunity today to know Christ, to live for Christ, and to make his glorious name known. What is your perspective on your accomplishments? The second thing right there is, is his life efforts. Later on in Philippians 3, it says this in 3.12. His is what his perspective on efforts Not that I've already obtained it or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind me and and really reaching or pressing forward to those things that are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, you know what? I don't care about what I've done. I don't care about the work I've done in Christ. I don't care about my tainted past of persecuting Christians. I'm not gonna get bogged down in my past failures and I'm not gonna rest easy on my past successes. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna press on and I'm gonna grow and I'm gonna work and I'm gonna use today to do great things for God and his glory. He said, I'm not gonna dwell on the past. And I, I love our senior pastor, Dr. Young. He's been at second for 41 years. He's done some amazing things as the leader of this church. But when you talk to Dr. Young, he doesn't talk about having over 80,000 members and six campuses and who knows what's on the horizon. He doesn't talk about being the president of this or, or going and hanging out with this person or how many sermons he's preached or how many people have come to know Jesus through his preaching of the word. You talk to him, he goes, man, if you just stick around, God's gonna do some great things in and through this church. He's pressing on. It's never satisfied with what you've done in the past, never resting easy. There is no retirement in your walk and journey with Jesus Christ. God is never done using you and using me for his glory and building his kingdom. Press on, grow, don't get comfortable with where you are. His perspective for his efforts were, you know what, forget what is behind and press on what is in front of you. Think about your your windshield in your car. The size, because we don't totally forget what's behind us, the size, kind of the perspective that we have is that rear view mirror, which is pretty small, compared to how big your windshield is. See, most of our effort needs to be forward. Now, can we look behind us and learn from our mistakes or celebrate our successes? Absolutely. But Paul's perspective was, I'm gonna strain, I'm gonna press on, I'm gonna work toward growing and doing more for Christ today than I ever have. And if we as a church family would strain and press on toward what God has in store for us, man, what an impact. What a difference, what an eternal difference we would make for God and his kingdom. And then the final thing of his perspective, and really Paul's full of his life perspective in all 13 of those, and then plus much of Acts is written, written given the biography of Paul. But this final thing right here that I'm gonna hit is life's attitude. In Philippians 1, he says, but I want you to know, in verse 12, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Let's stop right there because I want to explain to you what's happened to Paul. He's been run out of town. He's been disregarded. He's been stoned and left for dead. And now currently as he's writing this book to the church in Philippi, he's in prison. He's writing using the old dab and ink pens with chains on his wrists and his ankles. Being falsely accused and imprisoned for his faith for being totally obedient to Christ, the thanks that he gets is the fact that he's in prison. And this is Paul's perspective. He says, you know what? Everything that's happened to me has really helped the gospel progress. And how many times when we go through difficult circumstances in our lives, do we have the attitude, woe is me, God, how could you? How could you let me go through this thing? Where are you? Paul, in prison, says, you know what? This is awesome. There is such a joy here in prison because look at what happens in verse 13. So it's become evident to the whole palace guard and to the rest that my chains are in Christ. 
And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Here's what he says. The guards are coming to know Christ. Instead of me sitting in prison and wallowing just kind of up in my own sorrow and regret, instead of me saying, why me, God? Where are you? Paul's going, hey, prison guard, let me tell you about Jesus Christ and his love and forgiveness. Let me sing songs of praise and gratitude for my Lord that has rescued me. That these chains are nothing compared to the freedom that I've experienced in Jesus Christ. And whatever circumstance you're going through and that I'm going through, if we could have that perspective of Paul's attitude, that that fact that there is joy in all circumstances. Let's read on it because it's amazing. Some indeed, in verse 15, preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this, I what? I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Let me explain to what he's saying. Explain what he, He's saying, you know what? Some people out there are trying to stir up trouble. They see me in chains and they're trying to spread the gospel truth so that I will get in more and more trouble. He says, some people are trying to stir up strife and envy. They're preaching the gospel to make my life more difficult. They think that me being in chains, it'll be even harsher. My punishment will be harsher if they stir up this wave of Christianity. Now, there's other people out there preaching for the right reasons. And this is what Paul says. Even those people who are preaching out of false pretense, out of envy, who are trying to make my life difficult, who cares? The gospel is being preached. And praise God for that. For that I will rejoice. Again, he says rejoice. And when you read through the book of Philippians, written in prison, There is a common theme of joy and and be a part of the church and the church is the answer and Jesus is the answer and joy is the result of living a life for Christ. It's not gonna be easy, but it's gonna be joyful. His attitude in everything that he wrote, in every conversation that he had, in every sermon that he preached. In fact, when you read through Acts, it's awesome because he gets brought before all these judges and all these government leaders They said, Paul, what do you say? And he just goes back to his testimony. I was lost, Jesus found me, and now I'm free. And you can know Jesus as well. And he's preaching to this one, really this is his defense. He doesn't have an attorney, he just preaches the gospel. One of the, of the, the government leaders says, do you really expect to convert me to Christianity in such a short time? And Paul's response is, short time or long time? I'm just praying that you come to know Jesus. And that's our goal. That's the joy that we have when we realize that regardless of our circumstance, whether you have something at work, something, a health issue, anything in a relational issue, God can use that if you have a joyful attitude that God, whatever it is, you work out really all things for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And then the final thing that really set Paul aside, not only is really his incredible perspective. It was his lasting endurance. Paul's lasting endurance. Because this Christian journey is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And if you wanna make a tremendous impact for God's kingdom, if you wanna be a man or a woman of God that the angels applaud, then you have to finish the race. I oftentimes talk about how glorious it's gonna be to hear our Savior say those wonderful words, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's on the other side, that's on that side of heaven. But I think about the way that Paul finished his race. And I think about what if God gave us the opportunity to write our own epitaph? What if God gave us the opportunity, you knew the day you were going home, and you could say those final words, You could write your obituary in the newspaper and have it printed. If you had the opportunity to write your own final chapter, could you write it like Paul? 
2 Timothy, last book that he wrote, chapter four, last chapter. This is as he's preparing to pass. In verse six, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, for in the time of my departure is at hand. This is glorious. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me crowns of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, not only to me, but also those who love his appearing. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. What made Paul the greatest Christian, the most influential man that's ever walked the earth? Because he finished his race. It wasn't just sprinting out of the blocks after his road to Damascus experience. It was the fact that he lived a lifetime of persecution and joy and effectiveness and evangelism and church planning and spreading and pouring into the lives of other people. He lived a lifetime from the point of his conversion on to making an eternal impact for God's kingdom. He poured into the lives of people, he poured into the church, and he loved the Lord. And he kept Jesus Christ his main priority. And because of that, he experienced a joy that was evident to all. And he fought the good fight. He finished the race, and he kept the faith. Are we going to be able to say that at the end of our days? Are we going to be able to finish on this side of heaven and look at those who love us, our family and our friends, as we are breathing our last breath and say, man, I've fought the good fight. I am finishing my race and I have kept the faith. Because it's not a life that starts well that makes a huge impact for God's kingdom. It's a life that ends well. It's a life that is persistent and has lasting endurance that starts and in the middle of the race and at the end of the race lives and runs for Jesus Christ and his kingdom. That's what makes a person an impactful follower of Christ. That's what makes people stand up and go, that man, that woman was a faithful follower of Christ. If you have a conversion experience and know the Lord, if you have that perspective of keeping Christ and his kingdom work first, and you run your race with endurance so that you may finish well and keep the faith, that is what makes you and makes me a, a Christian, an impactful Christian, one that will make a difference, not simply here on this earth, but an eternal difference in God's kingdom forever.